Lotus. Just saying that name brings back memories of innovation and Grand Prix glory. The monocoque chassis, stress member engines, four-wheel drive, wings, turbine engines, inboard brakes, side mounted radiators, anti-dive suspension, carbon fiber chassis, spread effect aerodynamics, active suspension, the list goes on and on. Combine it all together and you basically have the components of a modern day F1 car. That's how far ahead they were for the time. It's why they have seven Constructors Championships. It's why they were the first team to win 50 Grand Prix, despite starting seven years after Ferrari. But their last title was 1978, and the team folded 16 years later as but a shadow of their former selves. But what if 1978 wasn't their last World Championship? Sure, it was their last F1 title, but there are other FIA World Championships out there. And this is the story of the car that gave them their last world title. The Talbot Lotus Sunbeam. Chrysler's British division was struggling in the 1970s, and they decided to follow British Leyland's route and get some sweet, sweet government aid in 1975. So a 55 million pound check was written for a new Super Mini for the British market. But 55 million pounds still isn't a lot for development even back then, which meant that the new Sunbeam had to be a budget build. The chassis was a shorter version of the Avengers chassis. The engine was from the Hillman Imp, and the steering was from the Simca 1307. But unlike those, the Sunbeam was a hatchback only. And unlike almost every other hatchback ever made before or since, it was rear-wheel drive. It also wasn't great, and Chrysler was still losing millions of pounds and sold the UK division to Peugeot in 1979. And it was Persia who decided to resurrect the defunct Talbot company and rename the new Chrysler Sunbeam the Talbot Sunbeam. And their first order of business after the naming change was improving the Sunbeam's abysmal reputation with the TI performance model in 1979. The TI had twin carbs to make 100 horsepower and featured less amenities to reduce weight. These actions dropped the 0 to 60 time from 22 seconds to 11.5. So yes, it's 11 seconds faster to 60 than the base model, but the base model is also slower than Usain Bolt. So, yeah, it's not great. But despite the still sluggish 11.5 seconds 0 to 60 time, enthusiasts went nuts for the Sunbeam because of its rear-wheel drive drivetrain, making it surprisingly tail-happy for 100 horsepower. And all that hooliganism got people thinking. This Sunbeam might be good at rallying. Now the idea dates back to Chrysler's motorsport director, Des O'Dill, who started funding a world rally team in 1978 for the upcoming 1979 season. But Chrysler had no experience in rallying, thought it was a stupid idea, and refused to fund the program. So O'Dell bought a Lotus Esprit engine, stuffed it into a Sunbeam, and DIY'd a rally car out of what was left. So once the forbidden prototype was ready, he invited the top brass to a parking lot and did some demo runs. And they were so impressed that they changed their minds and the green light was given for a rally program. Now since a Lotus engine was used in the prototype, Lotus got the contract to build 400 road cars for competition homologation reasons. These Lotus Sunbeams had the Type 911 2.2-liter .2 four-cylinder derived from the Esprit, making 150 horsepower and 150 torque through a four-speed manual gearbox. The Lotus did 0 to 60 in 8.3 seconds, which is, yes, pretty slow by today's standards, but it was 14 seconds faster than the base model. 0 to 60 is usually measured in tenths of a second, so being 14 seconds faster is ridiculous. These were proper super hot hatches making waves on both sides of the law. If the TI was a bit of a hooligan, the Lotus Sunbeam was even more of a hooligan. And the police agreed because the Manchester Police Department used 20 of them as interceptors to combat car theft and smash and grab robberies. While on the rally stages, it was even better. First entering the 1979 San Remo Rally, Tony Pond finished 4th 
on the Sunbeam's debut, a very respectable first outing, although they could not replicate that for the rest of the season, as their driver team crashed too many times to make a mark in the championship. So for 1980, the car was a little bit refined, and its driver lineup was completely rebuilt. I'm going to try to pronounce this guy's name, I do apologize, but he's French, and if he wanted to have a name that people could pronounce, they should have made it a bit easier. And unfortunately, it, he's the main player for the rest of the episode. And I, and I did honestly look at a French pronunciation guide, but I'm still, you know, not French, obviously. So, Julie Fricklin took two third place finishes that year to finish eighth in the championship. But all eyes are on the young gun of Henry Toivonen, who became the youngest WRC winner in history when he took Talbot's first win at the 1980 RAC Rally on their home turf. A record that he would hold until 2008. Nice going. So sure, the 1980 season had a bit of a rough start. Yes, Gui had some good finishes, but on the whole it was sort of a mixed bag. But they had a really nice ending to the season, which put them in a nice position for 1981. And for the 1981 WRC season, Talbot figured they had some luck. Ford withdrew, leaving just a privateer Rothman's team. The Fiat 131 of Barth was a four-year-old design by then. Audi was using this cumbersome and heavy four-wheel drive system that was just going to break down in every event. And Dotson had some pace last year, but it was still using an old Violet. Not exactly the hardest thing to beat on paper. At least that's what they thought. In actuality, every single one of those beliefs would be dismissed. Rothmans had two of the surprisingly good escorts. Marco Allen was still pretty potent in that Fiat. Four-wheel drive was an absolute game change that made everyone change their entire rallying philosophy forever. And Dotson had a team of great drivers with a potent little violent GT. So sure, the Sunbeam was further perfected and made 250 horsepower, but it was not going to be a cakewalk like they might have hoped. And in the snowy tarmac of the Monte Carlo Rally, the rear-wheel drive cars got some luck, as only one Audi finished the event down in 91st place, with the other car getting sand in its fuel system. Somehow. That allowed Renault to take the first win of the season with their R5 Turbo, followed by Talbot in second, and then Opel in third. But that look of rear-wheel drive superiority dimmed when Hanu Mikula took the first ever four-wheel drive win in the snow of Sweden, with the only consolation prize for the other competitors being that Sweden did not count towards constructors' title points. Portugal did, though, and with its mixture of tarmac and gravel Fiat, took the first win of the season with Allen at the wheel, but Toivonen scored another second place finish for Talbot, and that was enough to take the championship lead by 8 points ahead of Fiat and Opel who were tied for second at 26 points apiece. But the brutal Safari Rally was next, a rally more about survival than speed, and since Talbot is built by Britons and would inevitably break down, they didn't compete at all. So with most of the top teams absent, Dotson took a dominant 1-2-3 finish, shooting themselves up into championship contention while Opel snuck into the championship lead by scoring fifth for about two seconds, and then Talbot took a distant second place behind the privateer Lange Stratos, which took its 18th and final WRC victory in France, before Talbot, more importantly, again got a fourth place finish in Greece in the following round. And while all of this was going on, Talbot's rivals just kept taking points off of each other, as Fiat was battling Dotson, who was battling Rothmans, which meant that there was no single team running away with all the points to catch Talbot. And then, to make matters even better, Gui drove his Lotus to the top step of the podium in Argentina, Talbot's first win in nine rallies, and 1981's seventh different winner in seven rounds, and his victory meant that with five rounds to go, Talbot had an eight-point lead over Dotson, while Gouy had a 27-point lead over Marku Allen in second. Not a bad buffer with five rounds to spare, but we've reached sort of the second act, maybe the third act of this story, where things usually go catastrophically wrong for our protagonist, and um, 1981 was no exception. 
Vat then took his Privateer 4 to its second win of the season in Brazil, and then subsequently its third win in Finland. While Frecklin retired in Finland, bringing that 27-point advantage down to just 6. And Talbot retired completely in Finland, it wasn't just Yui, which meant that they lost the lead of the Constructors' title as Dotson took the championship lead. I mean, sure, Talbot returned the favor in San Remo, but then they retired again in the Ivory Coast, while Dotson took another victory, which meant that heading into the final round of the championship, Dotson was leading Talbot in the title by five points, while a further string of disappointments for Gui meant that he was just eight points ahead of Vatnin in the championship. Meaning that if he wanted to win, he would need to get at least second place no matter what, while Talbot needed a miracle and finish at least seven positions ahead of Dotson to scrape by with the World Championship. And in their home rally, things were looking dour. Audi charged off into the distance with their third win of the season, Vatnin was in a clear second place, and Talbot was having trouble. I mean, yeah, so was Dotson, but if all of them break down, Dotson still takes the title. And it really did look like everyone was going to break down. Toivonen retired with engine failure, while Gui retired with a broken fuel pump, the latter of which guaranteed Ari Vatnin the driver's title with the privateer Rothmans team, a feat not repeated until Sebastian Ogier's win with M Sport in 2017. So that was the driver's title done. No matter what happened, Vatnin had basically gotten in the bag and he finished second to secure it. But the constructor's title, that was still up for grabs as Dotson and Talbot struggled through the UK countryside with one car running apiece. And in the end, Peter Gale finished 14th for Dotson, while Talbot's guest driver, Sig Blomquist, finished 3rd, outscoring Dotson by 16 points to take the 1981 World Constructors Championship. Gouy's co-driver, John Tott, ever heard of him, was so impressed he convinced Persia to take over Talbot's entire rallying program, and he led Peugeot Talbot Sports at the end of 1981. A motorsport juggernaut that would go on to win nine WRC titles, seven Dakar rallies, five World Sports Car Championships, and three Pikes Peak Hill Climbs. But since Talbot's story ended in 1981, they have the dubious honor of being the least successful champions in rallying history. They won just as many titles as Mitsubishi and Alpine, but Mitsubishi has 34 rally wins to their name, Alpine has 6, while Talbot has just 2, only one of which was actually scored in their championship winning year. Instead, it was their consistency that was Talbot's biggest strength, scoring 6 additional podiums in 1981. And in all honesty, that sums up the 1981 championship pretty well. It's almost like it never existed. The driver's title was won by a privateer, so Ford couldn't really celebrate, while the constructor's title was won by a team with just two wins to their name, and who disappeared a few weeks after taking the crown. But all of this to say, what about the Sunbeam? People have pretty much forgotten this car ever existed, which isn't all that surprising. The Chrysler it was based on sucked. The company that Peugeot launched it with was brought back from the dead and later just made a bunch of mediocre garbage. And the one thing this car is really known for, its 1981 WRC Championship, was kind of forgotten about for the reasons that I already mentioned. So it's no surprise then that the Lotus was forgotten as well. And I think that's a shame because the Lotus Sunbeam is one of the greatest hot hatches of all time. It's light, fast, responsive, practical, and tuned by Lotus. Not many hatchbacks can lay claim to that. It's also unique in the hatchback game with its rear-wheel drive layout, which allows the driver to have a different kind of fun behind the wheel. Yes, hot hatches are always chuckable. They can usually cock a rear wheel up, but this one, this one can drift. You can't name many hatchbacks that can do that, certainly non-four-wheel drive ones with sort of cheeky differentials. So the Lotus Sunbeam may be cursed by circumstance to always be forgotten, but let me make it abundantly clear, it will also always have 1981.